Hey guys, what's up? My name is Gabe and this is Games with Gabe. Welcome to the next episode in the Coding a 2D Physics Engine series in Java. Now, as you can see, I'm doing my intro a little bit differently because I watched an episode by Ms. Is, is, is <laughs> and he was basically saying that he hates tutorials that take a minute long intro and don't just get right into it. So, let me know if you guys are going to prefer this. I'm going to do this for the next couple episodes in all my series. And just let me know in the comments if this is a better method, if you like me getting right into it, or if you would prefer more of an intro. So in this episode, what we're going to be doing is talking about force generators. And what the heck is a force generator? It's a concept that was coined by Ian Millington, I think. He uses it in his book, Coding a Physics Engine something or other. Uh, I have it linked in the description, but he uses this and this was basically one of the only things I liked from his book He had a lot of good concepts. It was just hard to follow, but this one was very easy to follow and I really liked it and the basic premise of this is in your game world You are going to have a bunch of different objects You'll have your player object and he has forces that are acting on him controlled by you, right? Because you're inputting controls into your device and so say you press the jump button well and you're pressing the right button. Now, all of a sudden, your player has a force that's acting this way, and we'll call this like input force. But he also has a force acting on him this way. We'll call that gravity. And he may also have a force acting on him this way, and we'll call that uh, drag, right? And if he has other things affecting him, maybe there's wind pushing him this way. And so you have the wind force too. Whereas this object, it has no, it's like some collectible or something, right? This object isn't even affected by any forces. It has no forces. This object, say this is some enemy or whatever, he has a simple input force from the AI. So we'll say that's the AI force pushing him this way. And then he also has gravity pulling him this way. And then he also has a force from these blocks pushing him up this way. So what I'm trying to illustrate here is you can see that there is one, two, three, four forces acting on the player that are not necessarily the same as the forces acting on this and definitely not the same as the forces acting on this, but they do share some in common. And so the whole concept of a force generator is basically abstracting these concepts into some big collectible registry is what we will call this a force registry where basically you have different types of force generators. So what these are drag is a force generator it generates a force this generates a force generates a force generates a force uh, maybe input wouldn't necessarily be one but these three definitely would and what these forces do is they all register into the registry and then the registry goes ahead and says okay i know which objects to update and i know how to update all of them because each of their force generators has this uh virtual or abstract i can't remember the term in java an abstract method that basically says update force and this update force method takes in a rigid body and it takes in a delta time. And so basically this is just a big data structure that we can use to sort of tidy up things in our physics engine a little bit and abstract our forces away to specific parts. And it also makes adding new types of forces pretty simple, which is why I really like this. For example, say you have a spring and you have some object attached to that spring and that spring is attached to a fixed point, like say a ceiling then adding the new force for a spring force is actually pretty easy because you just define a force generator for it that takes in uh, the rigid body here and then it takes in the fixed point here and then all of a sudden you don't have to do anything else you just add this force registry to this uh, you register this force with this object inside of our registry and then all of a sudden it, up, it gets its force updated the way that you defined it for this spring very cool concept now, what do we need in order to make this work? Because it's really not that bad. It's a simple uh, data structure that we're going to be using. We're going to have three main classes. Force generator, like I said. This one is going to just contain one abstract method, update force, which takes in a rigid body in delta time. This will be overridden by any of these. So these would inherit from force generator. They would implement it. Next, we have the force registry. So I'll call this force registry. And he's sort of the guy in charge of managing everything. So he manages all of the different generators and all of the different force registrations is what we will call it. Force registration is just a very simple class that holds a rigid body and it holds a force generator. So this thing, right? I'll call that FG. 
So rigid body and force generator. And so he's just sort of a wrapper class to hold the information. And then this force registry holds a list of these registrations. And then when we want to add something, we just add it to this list through the force registry. When we want to remove something, we remove it through this list. And then we will also have clear. And then update forces is going to be in the force registry too, which will just loop through all of these and then call the update method on this force generator calling it with this rigid body. And then we'll have a zero forces function. So I was just sort of giving you a high level overview of all the functions we will be implementing because it, it's really just a bunch of wrapper classes to help abstract things and make it, our lives a little bit simpler. With that said, let's get started. Now, before we do get started, I have to change a few things because there was a few errors in our methods, not errors, but we just didn't uncomment one thing, for example. So First, let's go into our box2d class. So if we go into here, you'll notice down in the get vertices function, I never actually did this. And so this is important because if we want to get the vertices, we actually have to rotate them. So we'll just get this. And then if you just move the rotation and the position right here in our parameters, then it will work just fine. Next thing we're going to do uh, up here, this says get min and get max. That's very deceiving because this isn't actually getting the minimum and the maximum. These are actually getting the local min and getting the local max. So this is like the box's local spaces minimum and local spaces maximum. And I think that's important to denote because we may implement a get global maximum and get global minimum, which would get the minimum of the rotated box and the maximum of the rotated box. So. I think it's just good to have these different names. I was kind of concerned about naming them that because it could get confusing. It's not actually doing what it says it's doing. Now let's go into our circle method because right now there is no way to actually set the radius and I have added some uh, unit tests. So I kept telling you guys the importance of unit tests and I finally got around to writing up a ton of unit tests. Uh, some of them we won't be able to use yet because we haven't implemented those functions. But for most of them, we will be able to. And so I actually have it in my development branch, but I will be pushing that and you guys can copy the unit tests that I put to make sure that you didn't make any errors in all of your functions for these, because that's really the only way we can test these is by having some good unit tests. And I've chosen some edge cases I think are good. And so it should check to make sure that you have proper functions, no errors in your functions. And on that note, let's go into our rigid body class. And we also need to add a few different variables. Since we're about to start talking about forces, it is nice to have some variables representing those. And we'll talk about these in more detail in the future. But for now, we're just going to add them into the class so that we have them. So we'll add a vector 2f, which is linear velocity, which is something that will definitely be needed for the rigid body. We'll also have an angular velocity, which is a float. And you'll notice We'll talk about this more, but it makes sense that this is a float because we only have one axis of dimension for our angular velocity, whereas for linear velocity, we have two dimensions. Then we'll say private float linear damping. This is basically almost like friction. And then we'll have an angular damping. Once again, like friction, except for the angular world. And then we'll have a private Boolean fixed rotation. And we'll set that to false. Uh, these are all just going to be helpful in the future. We're just having them there for now. Now I'm going to get rid of this set position and set rotation. And we're going to replace it with one function that says public void set transform. And this will take in a vector 2f uh, position and a float rotation. And then for this, we will just go ahead and say this dot position dot set position this dot rotation equals rotation and then we're going to go ahead and overload this so that we can use this in two different ways one where you supply rotation and one where the rotation is just not modified at all now the reason i'm changing it to these is because i looked at box 2d's code to see how it was going and remember i kept saying i don't know if storing the position in the rotation here is good well box 2d is actually does it that way so i've decided that we're going to leave it this way because if they're doing it, then there must be something okay about it. <laughs> and so we're just, they use this set transform method, which is a little bit easier for when you need to actually set the position and everything. Because uh, then you can set position and rotation at the same time. Okay, and then next, right now our rigid body is always null. So for my unit test, you obviously don't want a null rigid body. So we'll say set rigid body, rigid body 2D, RB. And we'll say this dot rigid body equals RB. 
and I'm going to copy this. We're going to go into box 2D, add this method here as well. We're going to go into circle, add this method in here also. And I named it body in here. I need to be consistent. So this is now rigid body, rigid body. Now we're good. And that should be good. That's all our primitives right now. We just have three. And last couple methods that we don't have, set size. Uh, that's also important. So inside of AABB, we'll go public void set size and we'll take in a vector 2F size. So then we'll say this dot size dot set size, this dot half size dot set, and we'll say size dot X over two, size dot Y over two. All right, and that should just set the size and the half size. There's nothing particular complicated about these. It's just things that we need to have done. And I'm going to go into box 2D and do the same thing here. All right, now we can get to the good stuff. We can finally start implement implementing our force registration thing. So let's go into physics 2D package. We're going to say create a new package. And we will call this forces because this is where all of our force data is going to live. Now we'll start with a couple of easier classes first just because... Uh, so we'll go into here, we'll say new class, this is going to be our, actually this is going to be an interface because it only has that one method that's not implemented. So we'll say new class, okay, there we go, interface, <laughs> and then we'll say force generator, and this will be that simple update method, right? It just contains a void update force, and this is going to take in a rigid body 2D, we'll call that the body, and it's going to take in a float delta time. And this will be implemented by any force that implements this. So like gravity would implement this and then it would apply gravity to this rigid body using the delta time passed in. We're going to go ahead and implement the next simple thing, which is a force registration. It's just sort of a wrapper class for a rigid body in a force generator. So we'll just create that real quick. And then inside of here, we'll say private force generator and we'll call that FG and we'll say private rigid body 2d and we'll just call that rb and i'm going to initialize both of these to null just so that we never get into some weird territory and then we'll say public force registration and this will take in a force generator fg and a rigid body rb and just set those appropriately oh and i guess the null doesn't apply because if this is our only constructor uh, it'll never just have the default values and I think we're going to keep these public too, because you can't do, there's this cool thing in C++ where you can make a friend class where only one class can see private member variables of another class. I don't think there's any concept of that in Java. So we're leaving these public because really the only class going to interface with this is our force registry class. And it needs these variables and it's, there's no point in having them private. Uh, before we do that though, we are going to do one more method and it's the equals method. So this is just a default method in Java. And what it does is it takes in an object, which is the other object. And this will just tell you whether like this object, the object that is currently being called with this equals method, equals whatever object was passed in. And we'll need this because I think we may be doing some sorting and stuff. Well, for removing objects and everything, we need to know whether it's the same object. So we'll say if other equals, equals null return false, and then we'll say if other dot get class does not equal force registration dot get class or dot class, then we'll return false also. Otherwise, we can safely cast it. We'll say force registration fr equals force registration, and then we'll just say other. Then we'll say return fr dot body equals this dot body or rb in this case, equals this dot rb, and fr.fg equals this dot fg. So we'll just be teching to see if they have the same generator and the same rigid body, and if they do, then technically it is. And we could abstract this a little bit more. Technically, if it's the same rigid body, and it's the same type of force generator, it is also equal. So we may extend this, but I think this should be fine for our purposes. Okay, let's go into here create another new class. This is going to be our force registry. So this is where all the magic is going to happen, okay? <laughs> now, force registry, like I said, is just going to contain a private list of force registrations. And we'll call this our registry. This is where they get registered to be updated. And then we'll say create a constructor. 
that literally just says this dot registry equals a new array list. And this is a forced registry, not a forced registration. Next, we'll say public void add. So just an add method, rigid body, RB, and force generator, FG. And then we'll just say force registration. We'll create a registration real quick equals a new force registration. And then we need the FG and we need the RB. So we'll pass those in. And we'll say registry.add that new force registration we just created. Then we will make the remove method, which also takes in a rigid body. And it also takes in, I'm going to call this RB for consistency. It also takes in a force generator, FG. And then we just say force registration, create a registration real quick, equals a new force registration, FG RB. And then we'll just say registry dot remove FR. And because of our uh, equals method that we overrode, this should work fine. And then we'll have a clear method because sometimes you just want to clear it when we reset. So we'll say registry.clear. And then we want an update forces method. This is probably the most important method. And it's all so simple, but this stuff is pretty profound in the way it works. And you'll see once we start implementing some forces, how nice it is to have this. So we'll say force registration fr is going to loop through the registry. And then for each one, we'll say fr.fg.update force. We're going to give it the body that's contained in that same force registration, which is RB. And then we're going to give it delta time that was passed in here. So this will go through and update each one of these forces using their own unique generator, which is really cool. It's a really cool concept. It's really simple to implement, and it's really profound in the extensibility it gives us. So props to Ian Millington on this. It was a great method, I think. And then we'll have a last one here, which is zero forces. And so this will go for force registration, FR in registry. We'll say fr.rb.0 forces, which is not something that we have implemented yet. I'm going to put a two, two here, and hopefully I do not forget to implement this. So implement me, and we will do this. Actually, there's somebody told me one time. No, there's a fix me. Yeah, okay, so to do fix me, it's, yeah, this works either one for this thing. So we'll say implement me here, and we will implement this at a later time. This is going to be it for this tutorial. Like I said, make sure to check for the link for the unit test and pull that because it will make sure that your functions have no errors. And then if you just run your project after that, just literally build it. It should run your tests if you've set them up properly. And then if you have any errors, then it should show that. And let's see what this says. Oh, and we have some errors that we never fixed. <laughs> Good thing I ran that. So let's do get local min here. We just need to change these because we changed the names earlier. And let's see if we have anything else. Uh, let's go up here, click this. And once again, just change this to local min and change this to local max. Okay, but what I was saying is basically you get the little green bar, your tests passed. That means you implemented all the functions properly. If not, if one of my unit tests fails, then it will show up red and you'll have an assertion failure here. And you should probably take a look at what that is because you may have implemented one of the functions wrong. That is it for this tutorial though, guys. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, please hit like and subscribe. And I will see you guys in the next episode. Thanks.